Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true encounters from the deep woods sent in by viewers just like you. Now, some of these stories may be new to you and some of them may be old. This is going to be a longer episode than usual as I'm compiling a bunch of the favorite stories that I've shared over the past month and some new ones sprinkled in there for you guys. Hopefully you'll enjoy this episode. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, whether it's a scary story from the deep woods or somewhere else, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. I also recently started streaming on Twitch every Monday and Thursday. Sometimes I stream in between there. I'm doing horror games, reading scary stories live, and just hanging out with the community. You can find the link to follow me over there and interact with me more. It's a good place to get one-on-one -on -one time with the Swamp Dweller, as weird as that may sound. You can call me Leapfrog. That was my trail name, and this is the scary stuff I experienced on the Pacific Crest Trail in the summer of 2016. I'm from Texas, just graduated college with one of my best friends and his cousin. We'll go by their trail names as well, Paperboy and Chaps. We were dead set on hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. My friend had experience doing week-long treks and was an Eagle Scout, whereas Chaps and I were pretty novice hikers. Because of this, I decided to skip the desert and join them on the trail in the High Sierras once they got there. Once I arrived in Lone Pine, California, it only took a week into hiking for Chaps to run out of money and unfortunately must depart from the trail. It sucked, not just because we lost an awesome friend that made our hiking group a lot of fun, but it also meant I was losing my hiking partner. You see, on the trail you have a main group of hikers you head out on the trail with when leaving the town you've been resting at. You stay together for as long as you can, but as days go on, you gradually move at your own pace of hiking and soon separate. Without chaps, I never really tried to keep up with the ridiculously fast pace of my other friends, so many days of hiking were spent alone, and to be honest, it was amazing to be alone. Cowboy camping under the stars in the Sierras in Northern California wilderness, it was pure ecstasy. You can feel one with nature and on top of the world. It can also, however, leave you vulnerable. Fast forward two weeks into hiking, separated from my main group all this time. Cell service is limited, and I finally get a hold of Paperboy. He tells me to meet up with him and his crew in Belden, California, for a music festival. I felt compelled to catch up with them there. It was 60 miles from where I was, down near Truckee, California. So, I kick it into high gear and try to crush out as many miles as I can. After realizing I'm not going to make it in time, and there's no real chance of catching a hitch in the middle of nowhere, I make one of the smartest decisions of my life. I get off the trail and cut across desolate dirt roads and trails that would seem to get me there faster. I set up camp and make some ramen and powder eggs and get to bed early as usual. I wake up suddenly to the sound of deep, rhythmic sniffing outside of my tent. I hear coyotes, deer, and other animals outside of my tent quite often and making the slightest bit of noise will usually make them scurry off. So. I hear this thing sniffing and simply roll over in my sleeping bag. In the blink of an eye, I hear a literally ground-shaking stomp and my eyes are suddenly bulging awake. In a matter of 15 seconds, I go from curious to pure primal petrification. When it made the noise, it sounded like a person jolting to their feet, startled and defensive. The size required to make that booming stomp couldn't possibly be human, I thought. This is the realization that really makes me pee my pants. After this initial stomp, everything went dead silent. There wasn't a sound from whatever lurked outside my tent, and it's the middle of July. There were no bugs chirping at all. This is highly unusual. This is the point where I reached a state of complete petrification. My eyes were shaking, staring into the corner of my tent, but I couldn't move a muscle even if I tried. I could barely breathe. I was very closed-minded before this experience and thought such four stories of spooks and cryptids were complete nonsense. But here I was, alone in the woods, no one around to hear me scream and at the mercy of some giant, quiet creep. 
My panic was so extreme, and I just kept waiting to hear any other noise after the stomp. I heard nothing, and eventually, I just passed out from pure exhaustion. In the morning, I tore down my camp as soon as possible and sprinted for the road, begging for a ride out of the nightmare. And, by the grace of all the higher powers up there, I did just that. I made it to the festival, stayed as close to my friends to the rest of the NorCal and Oregon route, and it was nothing but smooth sailing until we got to Washington. Washington is a beast all its own. The very look of the landscapes looks like a place forgotten by time. I had gotten back my confidence to hike alone and put that terrifying experience behind me. In Washington, most of our crew had dropped out and it was only me, Paperboy, and Mittens left from the original crew. Mittens and Paperboy were always the fastest, so the writing was on the wall. From the moment I stepped on the Yakima Reservation of the trail to the moment I quit the trail in Skycomish, Washington, there was this unshakable, undeniable sense of being watched constantly. I would turn around 200 to 300 yards quickly just to make a quick view of the area. I was so sick of the paranoia. It really wasn't worth it to me anymore. So I got off in Skycomish, Washington, leaving Paperboy in mittens among so many others to finish the epic journey from Mexico to Canada. Tragically, some never made it off the trail. One man by the trail name of Sherpa, I met him near the start of my hike on the PCT. He was hiking alone in Washington and vanished without a single trace. It's spring 2019 and they still haven't found any clues as to what may have happened to him. This is exactly why I feel it's important for me to share this story. Long distance hiking is becoming more and more popular with novice suburbanites and yuppie hikers and I'm not trying to scare you away from this truly incredible and beautiful growing experience. However, it is far from a playground. A simple fact of the deep woods is there are simply things we can't comprehend. Educate yourself on the ancient history of the land and don't just take the history for myth. Always be wary of your surroundings. Listen to your gut and your primordial instincts. If something doesn't feel right, leave. As we say in the thru-hiker community, the trail is always there. When I would hear the adage, right place at the right time, I'd think to myself, yeah, okay, it's all just coincidence. But after what I've been through these past six weeks, my mind is changing. Maybe you are put in a specific place at a specific time for a reason, but I digress. As most of you know, the Pacific Northwest, for those unfamiliar, was recently ravaged by an ungodly number of wildfires. Seeing all the little fire emojis dotted all around the maps of California, Oregon, and Washington made my heart ache. My home was burning, fortunately for myself and my family. Our area had not been hit as hard as many others. I had planned on camping for quite a few weeks prior to this pandemic of wildfires, so I was happy to see that my usual spot was not near any major fires and subsequently had been deemed safe to camp and travel in. I am a camping enthusiast and enjoy deep wilderness camping on the Pacific Crest Trail as much as I can. My usual spot is remote. It requires an hour drive up a two-lane road into the middle of nowhere. This is followed by a 30-minute drive up an old logging road that ultimately crests a small mountain. The mountain slope leads into a beautiful valley, with much larger mountains encircling the valley from the north and east. In the center was a decently sized clearing, a valley if you will. The clearing was littered with fallen logs, beautiful pink and yellow yarrow flowers, and the occasional family of white-tailed deer. This was my true happy place. This valley does have a name, but I will keep it hidden for anonymity purposes. I left on a Tuesday morning in early September. The drive to the mountain was relatively uneventful. Besides almost hitting a large buck who decided to cross the road right in front of my truck, I arrived on the mountain's crest and began unpacking the bed of my truck. I had just recently bought a new 2020 Toyota Tacoma. I parked my truck facing the clearing. Roughly five feet from the edge of the small drop-off, the slope down to the valley wasn't steep and is very easy to hike down. I would definitely call it a beginner's trail. I'd say it's about 400 to 450 feet from where I parked down to the valley floor. I had camp set up just as dusk was setting. 
I usually would have a large fire going, but with the previously mentioned wildfires, that was not really going to be possible. I brought a small propane stove and a space heater to prevent any accidents. As I finished gulping down my last bite of dinner, I noticed it was quickly growing dark. I hopped off my tailgate and made it into my driver's side door. As I was digging in my pockets for my keys, I looked down into the valley and noticed something quite strange. I could make out two circular small lights in the far distance. They flickered as they quickly moved closer to the clearing. It looked as if they were hovering and navigating through the trees at a steady pace. I crouched down in front of the truck and looked on, curiously. I watched for a few minutes until the lights eventually arrived at the tree line of the clearing. I could hear the humming of a motorcycle engine or something like that echoing from the valley. That's when I realized what I was staring at. What on earth were these two people doing riding dirt bikes all the way out here, in the dark? This was the first time I had ever seen another person out there. The lights were stationary at this point. I assumed the two riders were off their bikes and walking around the clearing. Although that is only speculation, as I couldn't see anything aside from the two bike headlights. I knew they couldn't see me as of yet, as I had no visible lights or a campfire. I instantly thought to grab my phone out of my glove box. Local news stations warned the public of suspected people intentionally starting fires in the woods. They encouraged citizens to be vigilant and gather any evidence they could. In an absolute lapse of judgment, I pressed the unlock button on my keys. My truck lights flashed, and a loud beeping sound rang out. I had just given a beacon of my location to these midnight riders. In a rush of adrenaline, I threw myself on the ground stomach first. My mind was screaming, Good going, Einstein! I could barely think as my heart was pounding in my ears. I watched as the bike lights began to turn back in the direction they came from, and eventually disappeared into the darkness. I could hear the engines revving harder than they had before. That unsettled me a bit. As I stood up and brushed myself off, I began thinking about how odd it was. Usually, people with good intentions do not run off like that when they notice another camper. These people were obviously up to no good down there. Maybe drug traffickers, meth cookers, arsonists. My mind was filled with all the potential threats I might have alerted to my location. I sat in my truck and mulled over the options. Should I drive home? What if they were waiting for me at the end of the logging road? Was I overreacting? I decided to pack up camp and spend the night in my truck and drive home first thing in the morning. After packing everything up, I drove down the logging road a little way and backed into a small gap in the mountain face. That way, if the midnight riders decided to pay me a visit, they might miss me. I was in full paranoia mode. I lowered my seat back, racked around in my shotgun, and eventually dozed off as adrenaline turned into exhaustion. I awoke to my alarm, with my life for hire by a day to remember blaring from my phone. In a groggy daze, I sat up and rubbed my eyes. My phone said 6.32 a.m. Looking at my windshield, I could see some thick brown smoke swirling in the wind. As I stepped out of my truck, I was hit with the intense smell of burning wood. As you guessed it, there was a fire very close by. I jumped back into my truck and raced back up the mountain. From my camping spot, I'd be able to get a better understanding of the situation. As I drove up way too fast up this narrow logging road, I noticed the smoke was thinning out as my elevation grew. My heart sank at this realization. When I reached the crest, I jumped out into the truck bed and looked out over the valley. I could see blue skies above the mountains across from me, to the north and east. My heart sank as I confirmed my suspicion. I turned towards the logging road to my right. I could see the smoke thicken from that direction. I was trapped. My mind instantly went to the two riders from the previous night. I grabbed my phone, praying for a signal. Of course, I had no such luck. I jumped off my truck bed and threw my passenger door open. I frantically searched for my backpack. I ripped it apart. Once I found it, looking for my GPS satellite phone, I kissed it with joy when I grabbed it from the bottom of the bag, flipped it open, and thanked the Lord I had a signal. I called 911 to report the fire and request help. I chatted with the operator for somewhere around 15 minutes or so. The operator said she'd connect and have local wildlife firefighting companies come out ASAP and attempt to get a helicopter to evacuate me. After being on hold for a few minutes, I was transferred to a helicopter pilot with a wildland firefighting company that was nearby. I mentioned the valley by name and the man said he knew where it was. He claimed they were sending a helicopter to pick me up and that I needed to be there and ready to leave as soon as they landed. After we disconnected, I rushed to clear out my truck of any valuables. Sadly, 
rubbed the dashboard and said sorry to my new truck as it was evident the fire would eventually consume her. I then gradually started making my way down the slope into the valley. After only falling a few times, I reached the valley floor. I bolted through the trees towards the clearing. My lungs were on fire as I was nearing the clearing. As I broke through the tree line, I collapsed on the ground, gasping for air. After only a few minutes of lying there, catching my breath, I got back into my feet. I started walking towards the center of the clearing. When I got to what I assumed was the center, I glanced up at the peak of the small mountain. I could see my bright red truck sitting there where I left it. Roughly 200 feet off the left was a wall of fire. Black smoke was rising from the wall as it raced up the mountain. I turned away not wanting to watch $39,000 literally go up in flames. I began scanning the skies searching for my rescue. I concentrated on listening to the chopping sounds of helicopter rotors. As I stood there listening, I heard something else that made me question my sanity. Just off to my left, I could hear someone crying. A shock wave ran through me. I stood there unable to believe my ears. I upholstered my handgun and called out. Hello? Someone there? I then began to hear a muffled screaming. I ran towards the screaming and trying to hold back tears. I noticed a piece of plywood, roughly four feet wide, eight feet long, covered in branches and dirt. It was laying on the ground with a large boulder set on top. I called out, Hello? I heard the muffled screaming again, this time much louder and unmistakable. Is someone really under this plywood? I thought to myself. I rushed to move the boulder. After struggling for a few minutes, I finally managed to push the boulder off the plywood. I slowly lifted it up and threw it to the side. What I saw was something I will never forget. Sitting inside a small hole, probably no bigger than four feet by four feet, was a woman. Her wrist zip-tied and her mouth gagged with a piece of cloth. I gasped and took a step back. I couldn't believe it. What the hell was going on? The woman was frantically looking around. I snapped out of shock and rushed to help her. She flinched as I reached out to grab her. I lifted her out of the hole. I took the cloth from her mouth as she frantically started yelling in Spanish and raising her arms. I told her to calm down. You're safe now. I cut the zip ties that were binding her wrist. She instantly started pointing behind me, repeating, Mijija. I didn't understand her or really what that meant. I knew no Spanish. I turned around and quickly see four more pieces of plywood scattered across the clearing. I was horrified. I rushed over and started to flip them over one by one, but they were empty. The woman, following me as I did this, let out a painful cry as I flipped the last piece of plywood over, exposing a fourth and final empty hole. She collapsed on the ground and began sobbing. I tried to ask her what was wrong, but I couldn't understand her. As I attempted to console her, I could hear the distinct sound of helicopter rotors. I looked up to see the chopper descending into the valley. I helped the woman up and put her arm over my shoulder as we rushed away to the awaiting chopper. A man jumped out of the side doors. As we reached out, he said, You didn't tell us there was two of you. I yelled back trying to be heard over the rotors. I just found her. I have no idea what is happening. He replied with, y You found her. What are you? Never mind. We don't have time. Get in. He helped me get into the helicopter and shut the doors. Soon after we started to ascend, I looked down over the valley to see the fire engulf the peak and was halfway down the slope towards the valley. I sat back in relief. I was finally safe, but I had so many questions. The state police and EMTs met us as we landed back at the base camp. I explained the entire situation and they took the woman and me back to the station. Eventually, I was released after retelling my story to six different officers. My wife picked me up and I was able to return home. That was not the end, unfortunately. Over the last six weeks, I have been interviewed by local authorities, state authorities, the U.S. Marshals, ICE, and even a pair of FBI agents. My final interview was with the two FBI agents. They were the only ones who gave me any real information on the situation. After retelling my story just as I did here, they filled in some holes for me. They explained to me I most likely stumbled upon a human trafficking operation. When I unlocked my truck, it spooked them. He said I was lucky that I hid in that gap when I did as they most likely went up the logging road to quote-unquote handle me. When they couldn't locate me, they probably assumed I had left to get the police. So they packed up any valuable assets, including the woman's young daughter, and started a fire to destroy any evidence before I could alert the authorities. I asked about the girl. The older agent informed me that she and her daughter were kidnapped from Nicaragua. The woman claimed that they were set to be sold to a wealthy Russian ogliarch. She was being held in government custody until she could be returned home safely, he said. She's lucky you came along when you did. You were at the right place at the right time.
Fresh out of high school, my friends and I decided to take one last trip together before we all split up to go to college. The Pacific Crest Trail was the destination. A few nights of drinking, hiking, and camping was exactly what we needed together. Ian, my boyfriend, picks me up from my house. I've never been to the Pacific Crest Trail, so he tries describing its beauty the best he can. <laughs> Babe, you're gonna love it, I promise. Nothing but fresh air and wilderness. We will be one with nature. I'm not so sure Mother Nature would approve of the ungodly amount of alcohol you have in the cooler. Well, what about this? Ian pulls out a sandwich-sized Ziploc bag of weed. I know Mother Nature would approve of this. She grew it. You've been holding out on me, I said, snatching the bag from his grip. I open it and take a deep breath inhaling the familiar aroma. It's a long ride. Might as well roll one up for the road. Sounds good. I'll call the others and get them to meet us at the location. Ian connects his phone on his Jeep radio, putting on his 80s hair metal playlist. I light the freshly rolled joint, and we settle in for a road trip. We decided to meet up at the Bridge of Gods. The Bridge of the Gods sits at the convergence of the historic Columbia River Highway State Trail, three national historic trails, and the Pacific Crest Trail. We walk over the bridge together, being extra careful because there is no shoulder on the narrow bridge, and we must share with cars and trucks. We make it across with no problem and hike for a while until we decide to go off trail to find a spot to set up camp by the river. Three tents between six people, Nova and his girlfriend Tessa, the twins Sadie and Katie, and finally myself and Ian. I sit back with a black cherry white claw and take in the beautiful, beautiful surroundings. The sky let out an orange glow as the sun sank behind the jagged mountains. The mountains came down to meet the cold, untamed river. Nova and Ian began to make a fire before the night came. As the darkness falls, the alcohol flows. The flicker of the flame lights the night. We all reminisce about high school and talk about all that we would like to do for our future. Ian gets quiet and stares off into the darkness that is the river. What's up, Ian? I ask. I think I can see the outline of a boat floating not far off the bank. We all look in that direction, Ian pointed. Yeah, I think I see it too, Katie said. Nova walks over to his backpack and pulls something out. He twirls it in his hand and looks at it for a moment, before putting it in the direction of what we think is the boat. Is that a gun? Put that up, Nova. I spoke. Chill out, Brittany. It's just a flare gun, Ian said as he grabbed my hand to calm me. Nova pulls the trigger, and a trail of light streaks out towards the boat. It lights up the immediate area around the dark outline. It was a boat. Not just our mind playing tricks on us in the dark. Two people stood in the flat bottom boat, looking our way. They wore orange hoodies that hid their face. Oh my god. People are watching us. Sadie said. Get the hell out of here, you damn weirdos! Nova shouted. Nova and Ian began picking up rocks on the riverbank and throwing them at the boat. After a few moments, we could hear the engine start and drive away. We finally get over being freaked out. We did our best to put the incident behind us and continue drinking and partying throughout the night before eventually passing out in our tents. I woke the following day to a commotion outside. I unzipped the tent and dragged myself out. The sun hit my eyes, and I winced as a sharp pain shot through my head. Drinking obscene amounts of alcohol seems like a great idea until the next day. When you have to wake up with a splitting headache and you get a queasy gut. I see Ian with his hands clasped on top of his head, standing in front of a flat bottom boat and sat on the riverbank on our campsite. Ian, what's wrong? What's going on? I ask. These assholes from last night, they docked our boat here and stole all of our supplies while we were sleeping. Nova walks up behind us. I'm having trouble finding the trail. I have some food and water stashed away in my tent. Let's refuel and go look like a group. After eating, with no supplies, we decided to cut our trip short, pack up, and look for the trail we strayed from to get to this riverbank. Let's split up, Nova said. We can go in pairs of two. Try not to stray too far from the others, so if you find the trail, you can alert the others by yelling. Nova and Tessa enter the woods, 
Sadie and Katie enter about 20 yards away, and Ian and I do the same. Ian grabs my hand and he leads the way. We say nothing to each other, only the sound of twigs breaking and brush under our feet fill the silence. I think I see something, Ian said. I look around to try and see what he sees, and that's when I notice it. I think we both figure out what it was at the same time by the terrified look we gave each other. To our left, a man in a bright orange hunting hoodie stood several yards away. He didn't move. He just looked at us. A camouflaged ski mask covered his face. He didn't move even when we ran into the opposite direction of him. Even without being chased, we ran as fast as we could, leading to me tripping over some undergrowth and falling. My extended hands were the only thing stopping me from slamming my face into the unforgiving ground. A sharp pain shot through my wrist into my elbow. I let out a yelp in pain. I'm not sure if it's broken, but I know it's at least sprained. The price I had to pay to save my face from colliding with the forest floor. Ian quickly comes to my side, helping me up and inspecting the hand. I held it close to my body. He flexed the wrist, sending a shockwave of pain through my arm causing me to jerk my hand away. Behind him, I noticed some movement. It was one of the men in the orange hoodie stepping out from behind some trees. I point a shaky finger behind Ian at the man. Ian glances over his shoulder to see what has me so shaken. We'll check this out later. Right now we have to run. Ian grabs my elbow, careful not to touch my hurt wrist. We make a hard left and quickly make our way to what is hopefully the trail we came in on. We break through the trees, but it, it's not the trail. It's a small clearing. It looks like someone has recently been here. A still smoldering fire set in the center of the small clearing. Sadie and Katie break through the brush into the clearing a few feet away from where we came in, followed by Nova and Testa shortly, to the right of where we came in. We all share stories, and they all sound very similar. These men funneled us to this spot, Katie said. Why do they want us here? What, what do they want? Nova responded. Well, you did shoot a flare at them, I say to Nova. The creeps were floating there watching us. What was I supposed to do? Stop fighting. It'll get us nowhere. We need to figure out how to get back to the trail, Sadie interrupted. We looked around the clearing. It was roughly about half the size of an NFL football field. There was nothing out of the ordinary other than the smoldering pile of coals left behind. Let's turn around together and enter the woods and search for the trail. It has to be close, Ian said. We began to walk towards the section of woods we had entered the clearing through, and several of the men with orange hoodies and camouflage masks stepped out of the tree line. We turned as a group and began running in the opposite direction. We got halfway to the other side of the clearing before there were more men wearing the same orange hunting hoodies and camouflage masks stepping out. More emerged from the tree line surrounding us. I'm pretty sure there were 12 of them in total. Some of them had rifles in hand. Our group huddles together as it looked like these hunters were slowly closing in around us. Two hunters grab the twins, Sadie and Katie, and begin to drag them away, kicking and screaming. Ian and Nova run towards the two hunters that grab the twins. Nova throws a punch that connects with the hunter's chin and drops him to the ground. Nova grabs Sadie by the hand to help her up when a loud boom fills the air. The unexpected explosion temporarily disorients me. My ears ring. I look around confused about what just happened and where the explosion came from. I hear Sadie let out a terrified scream. I look to see her coated in blood and Nova lying on the ground beside her. Ian turns around, running away from the scene unfolding before us. The look of fear in his face let me know exactly what had just happened. One of the hunters with a rifle had shot Nova. Ian took about two steps before another shot rang out. Blood spray came out of the side of Ian's head like a lawn sprinkler. Ian drops mid-stride, pulls her into the nearest tree line, and I hush her, violent screams. No additional words are needed as we began to both sprint away from the chaos. I feel terrible about leaving Sadie and Katie to die. But any other action than what I took would have led to all of our deaths. I could hear the hunters scrabbling after us. At least, that's what was running through my mind at that moment. Tessa and I ran full speed for what felt like miles. My legs burned, my lungs hurt, and I would not dare to slow down. To my relief, we stumbled upon the trail. I look around to regain my sense of direction. The bridge is this way, 
I yelled to Tessa, and we began sprinting again. We ran to the bridge, where we flagged down a car, and they called the emergency number to alert the police. I was frantic trying to explain to the officer what I saw, that we ran off leaving our friends to die. Tessa could only weep. She tried to tell her version, but she couldn't get the words out. Tessa was physically shaking, and instead of words, vomit was the only thing that came from her mouth. Several hours had passed and the sun was starting to set when the officers found my friends. The hunters had erected two wooden crosses that Sadie and Katie hung from. Their abdomens sliced open, and the twins were connected by their intestines tied together. Their guts decorated the wooden structure they hung from like a set of gory Christmas lights. Ian and Nova lay at the foot of the crosses. I don't know the reason behind the gruesome slaughter of my friends, but I do know. I'll never revisit the Pacific Crest Trail. This story occurred in the summer of 2008. I grew up in Oregon and was acquainted with the outdoors at an early age. My favorite hobby came to be hiking, particularly in the areas that are either very dangerous or isolated. The health benefits of hiking were secondary to the thrills of walking the edges of exposed cliffs, being in cougar and bear territory, and knowing that I was far from help. Into the Wild was released in the fall of 2007 and I immediately fell in love. Being a high school senior, I could barely go another week living in my parents' house. The movie spoke to my sense of adventure and inspired me to hike the California portion of the Pacific Crest Trail upon graduation. I made it from the Mexico border to Northern California without much incident. I saw rattlesnakes and bears, experienced dehydration, but nothing happened that made me fear for my life. Somewhere in the Lassen National Forest in Northeastern California, I walked around a bend in the trail only to be startled by two people sitting on a rock dressed in nearly all white. The faces were dirty, their appearance disheveled, and the man had a long unkept beard. Both seemed to be in their 40s. They looked like the couple who kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. What struck me as odd about the encounter was encountering anybody at all. I frequently went days without seeing a single human being. Their white clothes could be explained away by the need to escape the California sun. Their scruffy appearance could be explained away by the fact that most thru-hikers abandon personal hygiene on the trail. After I said hello, they said nothing and simply watched me as I passed. Even that, I didn't find too odd. I chalked it up to them being foreign and not knowing what to say. I camped a few hundred yards off the trail that night, as I always did. Following bear precautions, I hung up the leftover food I had cooked that night from a tree, approximately five feet or so off the ground. Packing up camp in the morning, I noticed the food was not there. I immediately thought it was a bear. Maybe it had entered my campsite, so I began to look for paw prints. I didn't find any paw prints, but I did find boot prints circling the campsite. Two pairs of them. One of these pairs led right up to the rope from which the food was hanging. I thought of the people I had passed earlier, and everything I qui- And everything had clicked. I quickly packed up and left. My mind was racing the entire day, but I figured the couple was simply hungry. If they had nefarious intentions, they would have come for more than the food, right? Several days had passed and my mind was at ease again. I began to circle my campsite with sticks to wake me up in the event of an intruder, animal, or otherwise. I awoke in my tent one night to the sound of those sticks crunching. I grabbed my hunting knife. I tried to relax by telling myself that in the middle of nowhere, the source of that noise is more likely to be an animal than a person. Then, I heard frantic whispering. It was impossible to tell which direction the voices were coming from. Being in the dark, surrounded by trees, a hundred miles or so from the nearest city, plays tricks on your senses. I debated yelling out, claiming to have a gun, but instead decided to be silent and retain the benefit of surprise. I heard footsteps circling my tent and was ready to slash and just destroy whatever was going to open it. But just like that, it was over. No more footsteps, no more whispering. I lied frozen awake in my tent until sunrise. Eventually, I opened my tent to find nobody there. The only evidence something had happened was the boot prints, the same as before. Several days had passed, and I was now in Shasta National Forest, probably 50 to 75 miles from where I first encountered the couple. 
The trail became a goat trail. Being on the side of a mountain and above the tree line, I could see the trail winding for miles in front of me and behind me. I stopped for water in the rare shade and noticed two hikers miles behind me. All I could see were two white dots moving along the mountainside. I immediately said out loud, Man, F this. This trip is over. I pulled out my map and looked for the nearest town, which appeared to be Castella, located off I-5. The only problem was, is it was still 25 miles away. I hiked well into the night trying to gain as much ground as possible. I kept losing the trail and decided to set up camp, this time far off the trail and into the forest. I got in my tent and tried my very best to sleep, but every little noise kept me awake. After a few hours in my tent, I heard the telltale signs of another bad night. The footsteps, the whispering, the sticks breaking. Sound travels far in the absence of another sound. I knew they were close but wasn't sure how close. All I could think was, this is messed up. This is so messed up. Finally, a flashlight hits my tent, lights up the entire thing and goes dark. I unzipped my tent and climbed out carrying my knife, yelling nonsense into the dark. It was sort of like that cliche scene in movies where people in the wilderness hear sticks breaking around them and the camera pans around the trees because the people have no idea which direction the sound is coming from. Then I heard footsteps running towards the tent and barely made out a figure moving in my peripheral vision. I turned and ran deep into the forest. I tripped several times and ran into several trees. After running for approximately five minutes, I tripped, rolled, and came to a rest next to a downed tree. I got under the tree trunk and laid still. I saw the flashlight moving around in the distance. I laid under the tree for what felt like hours, but I couldn't tell you exactly how long it was. I waited until I was certain that they were gone, but I didn't move. Eventually, birds started chirping and I knew sunrise would come soon. Once it did, I made my way back to the trail, abandoned my campsite, and walked the rest of the distance to Castella, where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses I-5. I hitchhiked my way down to the town of Mount Shasta and spoke to the police and forest service. They put me up in a motel for the night, and my parents drove to Oregon to pick me up the next day. I followed up with the police and forest service months later, who told me that there had been similar reports of items disappearing from campsites throughout the surrounding national forest. However, there had been no other reports of the terrorizing that I experienced. As far as I know, nothing ever came of the couple. The logging company I work for is tasked with clearing a large land for a housing development. While walking the ground, I spot several hickory trees grouped together. I note the location as I plan on taking them for myself over the weekend while everyone else is at home, resting for the previous work week. Some barbecue places in my area will pay good money for a load of hickory. That Saturday, I load my chainsaws and busting mauls in the bed of my truck and head toward the job site. At the entrance, a group of people gathers, protesting the clearing of the land. Save the animal's natural habitat or something. Save the animal's natural habitat or something like that. Those animals don't help me pay the bills, and until they do, I'm clearing it out. The protesters block the entrance. I slowly pull up roll down my window and politely ask them to move. The protesters stand firm. I push down on the gas pedal for a moment, giving one of them a bump with the front of my truck. I continued to do this until they finally decided to move out of my way. I creep into the entrance, continuing to push protesters aside with my truck. The last protester screamed in my window. These trees give us oxygen and provide habitat for thousands of animals. Screw the animals. I said as I spit in her face, quickly driving away before any retaliation could take place. It doesn't take long to find the hickories as I remember their exact location. Ten hickories in all. It's hard work cutting them, busting them up into manageable pieces, loading the truck down, and making several trips from barbecue restaurants to this location. I dread dealing with the rude protesters every trip, but the extra money would be worth it. I downed the first three trees no problem. This old saw I had restored was cutting through the wood like butter. I was ready to lay down the fourth hickory when I got distracted by movement in my peripheral vision. During this distraction, the saw kicks back, 
almost tearing into my leg. I dropped the saw. I looked down to see a rip in my jeans where I saw the blade caught it. That was too close. I say aloud, my heart racing from the close call. I spin around, ready to scream out profanities and belittle the little jackass protester that distracted me and almost led to the destruction of my leg. To my surprise, no protester was in sight, only a giant buck. Its rack was huge, 14 pointer at least. I'm an avid hunter and I don't think I've ever even seen one this big. If only I had my rifle handy. I'd have a nice head to mount on my wall and some nice meat for the freezer. Then something unexpected happened. The buck's eyes started to glow red. I investigate them, almost hypnotized by the red glow. I was in such a trance, I didn't hear the snap and pop of the now falling tree behind me. The tree glanced off my shoulder and into the side of my knee, collapsing me to the ground. The massive tree was still on top of my leg, pinning me to the ground. I let out a scream that I thought for sure one of the protesters would be able to hear. But after laying on the ground for several minutes in pure agony, it became clear they had not heard me. I began to assess the damage. My jeans were beginning to turn red from the blood. I stick my fingers into the rip previously caused by the chainsaw and rip the jeans. I continue to tear away at the fabric until only the seam connects the lower part of my jeans to the upper part. I roll the jeans up as tightly as possible, the flesh tender to the touch. I get the jeans just above the knee, and I can now see the bone protruding from my skin just below the knee. I get a slightly light head and must turn my head away. The sight of blood and bone sending a sickening feeling through my stomach. I must try hard not to vomit or pass out. I try yelling again. I scream until my voice is hoarse, but no one can seemingly hear me. No one is coming. I can't lay here for two more days, pinned under this tree, waiting for my friends and co-workers to come. I must do something. I plant my free foot on the massive hickory and began to push. The tree trunk starts to rock back and forth with each thrust of my leg. I try this repeatedly for what feels like hours, but I don't have the strength to push it off. I finally give up out of exhaustion. Days turn to night, and I begin to give up hope. I lay on my back staring up at the stars. This would be peaceful if not for the throbbing pain in my lower leg. Finally I pass out. I'm not sure if it was from exhaustion or blood loss but I welcomed it. I woke up to a sharp pain shooting up my leg. I sit up to find myself surrounded by a pack of coyotes. One gnawed at my exposed bone while another lapped up fresh blood now pouring from my wound. Nipping at my crusted over scabs like I had not eaten in months. A pop sends a shock wave of pain through me as one of the coyotes sinks its teeth through my hard exterior of my bone. A swift kick to the head of one of them sent a few of them in retreat, but they continued to hover around, licking the blood from the fur around their mouths, waiting for me to slip back into unconsciousness so they could finish their meal. Not tonight, assholes. I'm not giving up that easy. The rest of the night was spent trying to roll the massive tree off my leg until I gave out. I would rest for a while and try again all while keeping the coyotes at bay. Just before sunlight, I heard massive footsteps in the distance that sent the coyotes into a panicked run as they disappeared into the forest. Help. Please help. I try to yell, trying to get the attention of whatever was causing the footsteps. That's when the buck from before appears from behind the trees and walks directly up to me. The buck is standing over me, peering down at me with those glaring red eyes. You did this to me, didn't you? The buck lets out a snort in response to my question. What's next? The buck turned its eyes to the sky as five vultures circled. I'm sorry, I, I don't want to die. Tears are streaming down my cheeks. I'll quit the logging business. I'll never cut down another tree if I live. Please help me. The buck tilts its head to the side as if it was contemplating whether I should live or die. It lets out another grunt. His eyes, red, begin to glow brighter. My light begins to fade as darkness overtakes me. 
I wake up several days later in the hospital, part of me hoping that it was only a nightmare, but the notion is ripped away at my absence of my leg, amputated from the knee down. After recovering, I went home and sold my chainsaws, busting malls, axes. I even sold my wood-burning grill and got charcoal. I'm not sure where the local barbecue restaurants will get their wood now, but it sure as hell won't be from me. The crew unloaded the last piece of equipment and prepared to clear out the 100 acres of timber. My boss, Larry, has been trying to buy this land for years from an old lady that refused to sell. Over the years, the two began to be very hateful towards each other. I went in with him on many attempts to talk to this lady about selling the land. She politely told Larry to leave. When he refused and continued pitching his proposal, she disappeared into her house. Larry paced in front of the door a few times, visibly aggravated at her disappearance and the fact that she wouldn't hear him out. A few moments later, she came back to the door with a broom in hand. Leave, or I'll hit you. Ma'am, we both know you're not going to hit me. Please hear me out. A loud thump grabs my attention as I look up to see the business end of the broom go across Larry's head. He blocks the second shot with his forearm before fleeing off the porch and back to his truck. A few months go by. The old lady, I found out her name was Grace, passed away. Someone broke into her house and put a knife to her throat. The police described a brutal scene of furniture overturned, blood-soaked carpet, and the lifeless eyes of Grace staring back at them. The knife had cut so deep that it almost decapitated the poor woman. After months of investigation, the case went cold with very little evidence being left behind from the killer. The bank took possession of her land. Larry contacted the bank and purchased the land from them. Of course, the thought of Larry committing this gruesome crime has crossed our minds. It seems out of the ordinary for Larry. He seems like a genuinely nice guy outside of work. 100 acres is enough for him to make a nice profit, but... Hardly enough to kill over, right? Other than the half acre the woman's house sat on, the rest was nothing but forest. 99 acres of timber for the crew to harvest and sell. Despite the rumblings of the crew and the town thinking Larry would do something so brutal, our crew eagerly began working and clearing the timber. For the first week, everything went as expected. When the team and I started to notice things we couldn't explain. Small things at first. All five of the gas canisters that held the fuel for the chainsaws were tipped over, causing the fuel to leak out into the ground. Plug wires removed from the spark plug, a cut pull cord on a chainsaw, several things that would halt work but not stop us from fixing the problem and continuing within minutes. Things quickly escalated. We returned from lunch and someone had drained the coolant from our knuckle boom loader. I had inspected the machine myself that morning and knew that there were no leaks, and it was full of coolant. That caused the loader to overheat and break down, effectively stalling our work for weeks until it was fixed. Once again, things escalated even more. My coworker Billy and I worked together for almost a decade cutting timber. We had become close friends. Our wives were friends as well, and we hung out quite often outside of work. Knowing him well makes what he did next out of the ordinary. On this day, everything seemed normal. One luxury we didn't have in the forest was a working restroom. Sometimes we must do what we must. Billy grabbed a roll of toilet paper from his truck and went out into the dense trees to do his business. Upon return, Billy appeared to be on edge. He looked pale white and only responded with, It's nothing. Everything is fine. When asked if he was okay, he then left for the day complaining of an upset stomach, only to call Larry later to inform him he was resigning from his job. This wasn't like Billy. He loved his career. It's all he knew. I tried calling only to get voicemail or send him a text and get no response. As strange as this was, we continued without him. 
After a hard morning of work, the crew went to a local restaurant for lunch, but I decided to save a little money that day and bring my own. I stayed at the job site to eat my bologna sandwich and a bag of Cheetos. I sat down on a stump and bit into my sandwich, regretting my decision to go with plain white bread instead of the sweet Hawaiian. The sound of a rock hitting the ground grabs my attention. I look up to see the rock bounce a few times and come to a rest at the base of the stump I sat on. What the hell? My thoughts were interrupted by a second rock being launched into my forehead. I looked around and I didn't see anyone. Real funny. Throwing rocks is kind of childish. I looked around, expecting to see one of the guys returning from their lunch. Another rock collides with my chest. This time I noticed what direction the stone came from. I stand up, peering in the direction I believe the rock had been thrown. I see some slight movement coming from behind a tree. I slowly walk up to the tree expecting to round it and see one of the jackass employees I work with screwing with me. Instead, I see the fiery eyes of Grace staring back at me. I stumble backward at the sight of the dead woman, my foot catching a tree root and sending me to the ground on my back. Grace loosened her tense jaw to speak. Get off my land. Don't touch another tree, or I'll haunt you for the rest of your life. Then, I'll be waiting for you in death. I pick myself up off the ground quickly and run back to my truck, hop in and peel out, never looking back. More guys left after I did, all having similar stories of their own, but Larry refused to pull the crew and equipment off the land. He paid for it, it was his now, and he would make his money from it. Two months after I quit, what was left of the crew showed up one morning to find Larry hanging from one of the trees that was set to be cut down. Cops were called. And, in many years, nobody knows if it was actually murder or a suicide. Officially, it was ruled as a suicide, though. If I was a betting man, I would put money on Grace having something to do with it from beyond the grave. One thing I was sure of, when Larry took his final breath, I know exactly who is there waiting for him. I downed the rest of my cheap beer, the bitter taste filling my mouth before sliding down my throat. My buzz is intensifying as I close my eyes and lean back in my chair, listening to the pops and crackles coming from the campfire. Cynthia, my wife, sits beside me, using the dim glow of the flame to catch up on her favorite horror author's newest book. The peacefulness doesn't last as the distant rustling of feet close in on our campsite followed shortly by our 17-year-old daughter, Trina, and her boyfriend, Cole. It's getting dark. You two don't stray too far from the camp. Don't want you getting lost. While that statement is true, I was more worried about them doing other things. If Cole is within eyesight, I can ensure his manhood stays in his pants and out of my daughter. Cole opens the cooler and pulls out a beer. Grab me one, I said, remembering I had just polished mine off. He tosses it to me as he joins us around the fire. So, Cole, what are your plans for the future? I'm going to welding school, aerospace welding, to, to be specific. That's great. You may have picked a winner here, Trina. We aren't from around this part of the country. Sequoia National Forest is just one of the many stops we have been making for the past few weeks toward the west side of the country. Something my wife and I have wanted to do for quite a while now. Aerospace is a big business where we come from, so his decision makes perfect sense. What is that? Trina points to a light in the distance. The light slowly grows as it approaches our campsite. Probably the flashlight of a park ranger, Cynthia said. Oh crap, I blurted out. Cole, put the beer back in the cooler. Chew some gum or something. Anything to get that smell off your breath. The last thing I needed on this west side tour was to be arrested for letting underage drinking take place. Cole didn't get the chance to hide his beer before the light started overtaking the camp. What the hell? These are the only words I can manage, and the light becomes blinding. In a matter of seconds, the light engulfs my vision, and that's all I remember before waking up in my chair to a hysterical Cynthia on the phone with the emergency services about our missing children. A search party has been out several hours looking for Trina and Cole. At first, 
I thought my wife was being overly dramatic, but now I'm starting to worry. My baby is missing, missing in an unfamiliar place to us all. I have no idea where to begin looking. I feel helpless depending on the park rangers and rescue searchers. I should be out looking for her. My thoughts were interrupted by Trina stumbling out of the woodline and collapsing at the ranger's feet. After receiving an IV to help her recover from dehydration, Trina began to explain to authorities the series of events that unfolded after the bright light overtook the campsite. The light was so bright, I, I couldn't see anything. I'm not sure how it didn't blind us. The light only lasted a few seconds, and I was left looking for Cole with blurred vision. I yelled out for him, but he did not answer. After a while, my vision cleared and I peered around, only seeing my parents passed out in their chairs. I yelled out for Cole again, and this time I got an answer. Cole was standing at the edge of the tree line, beckoning to him. After checking out my parents, making sure they weren't dead, I ran to him, but he seemed different. His eyes seemed glazed over and lifeless. His voice never changed in tone, but I followed him anyway as he took my hand and guided me through the forest. I asked him several times where he was taking me, and he never answered. His grip would tighten around my hand and would continue moving forward. It felt like we walked at least a mile before stopping at an opening of a cave. The ranger pulled me aside while not interrupting her and told me he had a strange feeling. He was familiar with this area, and there were no caves within a mile of our map. In fact, there were no caves within several miles of our camp. I didn't want to go in. I tried to turn and run, but something about the cave would not allow that. No matter how much my mind protested, my legs pulled me forward into the cave. The cave was narrow and so dark, now I couldn't see a single thing in front of me, not even my own hand. I knew Cole was still in front of me though, leading the way. I could feel his presence even though I couldn't see him. After walking deep into the cave, I snap out of whatever trance that brought me this far. I reach a shaky hand into my pocket and pull out my phone. The screen lights up and I press down on the flashlight icon, lighting up the small passage I had been walking down. The light illuminated the wall to my right, where I saw thousands of spiders covering every inch of the wall. I shine the light on the cave ceiling and to the wall to my right. More spiders. Every one of them staring at me with those tiny black eyes. I can feel their legs crawling on me. I swat one away, then another. It feels like hundreds of them crawling on me at once. I pull my hoodie off and throw it. I shine my phone light on my body, but I don't see any spiders. The phantom crawling sensation begins to fade, but at the edge of the phone light, I spot something else. Cole? Is that you? My light illuminates Cole's face. He stares back, but it's not the same Cole that I'm used to seeing. He stares at me with eight black eyes. He opens his mouth, revealing two black fangs. His legs hovered above the ground as eight more long, slender legs sprouted from his back and propelled him upward. Cole let out a wet hiss, and drool sprayed into my face. I dropped my phone at a pure panic and sprinted through the dark. I can feel the squish of spider guts as I place my hands on the walls to help guide my way. I trip a few times in the dark, but adrenaline and fear won't allow me to stop. Finally, I see the light at the end of the tunnel, and I don't stop until I burst from the cave. The warmth from the sun graces my skin. It was close to midnight when I entered the cave. It felt like only an hour had passed but the presence of the sun told me it was much more. I continued to run in the direction I believe camp to be in. Then I spot the park ranger. Everything from that point on is a blur. Have you found Cole yet? Trina asked. I'm afraid not. Cynthia wraps her arms around Trina, trying to comfort her. At dawn, the rescue worker finally emerges with Cole in hand. Trina's phone in his pocket. They rushed a lifeless body to the emergency room. The doctors couldn't find anything wrong with Cole except a small incision in the back of his neck that took a few stitches to close. After he awoke, he was questioned by the police. He doesn't seem to remember anything after that bright light.
I've lived in this town all of my life. I know all the weird traditions that come with living in a place as remote as mine. But nothing explains what's happened at our deer park. I used to come out here most evenings during the pandemic, park up by the base of the hill overlooking the sanctuary and just immerse myself in nature. I was always mindful of the distance I had to keep from the deer, particularly during mating season, and it wasn't like the deer didn't know what a car was. These were in their own reserve, sure, but the trail cut right through their vast fields, and they'd grown accustomed to seeing cars all manner of times in day and evening, which is what made the situation much more unsettling. Starting last week, a sign was put up on the entrance gate to the park, impossible to miss as the car slowed and the tires rolled over the metal grates. With it being the late hours and very few cars on the road, I decided to stop and read it in full. A polite notice to our valued visitors entering the Oboro Nature Reserve. Our deer are exhibiting unusual behaviors, and we are politely requesting you observe the following guidelines in place as to best protect yourself and the well-being of our deer. 1. While the park is open 24 hours a day, we are recommending visitors do not stop their cars during observable grazing periods and on midsummer nights. You are welcome to drive through and observe from a distance, but please do not slow down or stop. 2. Should you be slowed or stopped at any other time and the deer be curious by your vehicle, act calmly and do not speed up. Let them inspect you and judge you as a safe passerby. If they begin snorting, that is your cue to leave. 3. There have been reports of deer standing on their hind legs and remaining idle in the fields. These rumors are a fallacy. Please do not pay attention to them. 4. There is a black stag that holds dominion over the western herd. His antlers are sharp and his stride is impressive, but do not attempt to approach him. Please pay him the respect you would normally and do not stare at any of the females in his harem. He will charge you. Bucks are not friendly. 5. Deer remember faces. They can recognize you from a distance and will verify your smell as you get closer. Listening intently the entire time, there are many of them and only one of you. You would do well to mind that. 6. Lastly, no matter what salacious rumors have been propagating amongst the community, the deer are not congregating in the dead of night. Deer are social animals that sleep and graze together in a herd. This is normal. The deer are acting normally. Drive safely. Keep your doors locked and have a lovely drive in the Aboro Nature Reserve. Strange, right? The notice wasn't your usual steel sign with carefully embossed wording. Rather, it had been hastily marked up and nailed to the wall adjacent to the welcome sign, as if in a hurry. I'd not heard any sorts of rumors around town, and nobody had complained about the deer park at all. We're a population of maybe 2,000 though it's not very difficult for a word to get about. Still, I had my routine and intended to stick to it. Some of the info was valuable for newcomers. There was indeed a large buck who paraded the western herd. His name was Jojo, and I fully believed he would gore anyone who outstayed their welcome or got too close. Beautiful specimen of muscle and authority. He ensured his harem would never be straying too far from him, and he seemed to be borderline obsessive about making sure they never went across the eastern side where the large swaths of trees were at. In fact, I'd observed him on multiple occasions actively nudging or ramming younger males away from the split in the road and back to safety. On the rare occasion that a member of the herd crossed the line, he would refuse to acknowledge them and actively keep them away from entering back, as if they were banished. As I drove through the archway, I'd realized I had not seen many deer in the eastern section of the park. Looking out my window and staring at the makeshift forest to my right and a burning question coming to the forefront of my mind that didn't leave as I reached the hill overlooking both sides of the hill. Where are the rest of the deer? It was, to say the least, unnerving to sit there and try to enact my ritual of riding under a clear night when there was a strict absence of the herd where they should be. I tried my best to focus, but something was just burning in my mind, pulling my eyes back to look at that same spot, time and time again. 
Eventually, I decided that I needed to get some fresh air and take a better look, satiate my curiosity, and then, with my mind at ease, I can get back to finishing my blog. The air is humid when I step outside. No breeze and the stars are out on full display. Thank goodness for no light pollution in the countryside. I leave the engine running and walk to the barrier my car is parked in front of, leaning over and taking a pair of binoculars I bring for slower days when I want to see the deer in better detail. As I direct my vision to the eastern herd, I see something darting in the tree line. It's quick, hairy, and seemed to move the second my binoculars motion toward it. Even a deer shouldn't be that spooked, especially from this distance. My joints seize up and I dang near drop the binoculars when I hear a familiar snorting from behind me. I turn and see Jojo, standing 15 feet from me, just by the rear of my car, and his eyes gleaming in my rear lights. His head is low, and his antlers are thick, sharp, and aimed at me. In that moment, I don't know if he was going to charge and whether I should be fighting for my life or not. Instead, I do as I was instructed and stay still, not making sudden movements as he snorts again, closing the gap between us slowly. As he gets within five feet of me, he rears his head up. I see the most baffling expression on his face for a fleeting moment. Fear. Something ripples through the eastern forest, and birds begin flying away in droves. Some of the deer herd in the western area are circling something and Jojo immediately bounds down and out of sight to control the chaos. I waste no time getting in my car and driving down after them, keeping the doors locked, the windows open a crack, and my speed at a decent crawl. As I come along the embankment that connects to the road, I see Jojo running full sprint towards another deer. He knocks the rival over and contorts the body as it skids across the grass and falls into the trail just ahead of my car. I know I'm not supposed to, but I stop the car and wait. In a choice between breaking the rules and breaking my car, I choose the former any day. The western herd deer under Jojo's command are gathering behind him, making horrific shrieks of terror. Jojo strides up and bows his head again in front of the still contorted deer, antlers on full display and dripping with black blood. It was a clear threat. Do not come back here if you value your life. I started wondering how I'd safely get this deer out of the way, or if I could mount the grass on the other side and go around it, when I saw something horrific unfold in front of my eyes. The body twisted itself around, and the limbs snapped to reset themselves. The head still cracked at an ugly angle, bones sticking out of the sides as it got into its shaking legs. Then it screamed. It sounded as if its lungs were filled with blood. A horrible muted cry of anguish that backed up every other deer but Jojo. I don't know what was keeping this thing standing, but it let its head flop lazily around as it carefully backed away onto the eastern side of the reserve before bounding into the tree line, as if nothing were wrong. My rational mind chalked it up to the adrenaline and instinct to survive, but it was impossible to shake the feeling that something was entirely wrong. I carried on driving as soon as the deer was out of sight, not looking at Jojo or the others as I carried on down the trail. For the remaining few minutes I felt unseen eyes staring intently at me until I crossed the threshold and back into civilization. I'd never been more grateful to see other humans. Or my bed. Something about the whole incident just took everything out of me. I was drained of all of my energy. As I slept that night, I dreamt that I was a deer alongside Jojo, frolicking in the herd and grazing peacefully. But as I cast my eyes upward to the sky, a bitter chill on the wind, I saw the moon bathed in an almost purple plume. A strange light cast onto the land and noises rustling from the woods opposite. I don't know how I knew this, but something in me instinctively knew we were not supposed to go there. I saw shapes begin to emerge from the trees and that same horrible shriek rang out again as I woke up in a sweat. I leaned forward to catch my breath and grab a glass of water. As I changed positions to reach for my nightstand, I swear I heard something running up the trail to my house. I was probably still half asleep, maybe just imagining it, but that didn't make it any more unnerving. I decided it would be best to drive out the next night and confront my concerns head on, take the bull by the horns, or the deer by the antlers. If I'm not going to sleep soundly, then I should use my time wisely and document what I'm seeing. Maybe pass it to the rangers in the morning, right? 
When I drove back out there last night, the atmosphere was vastly different. A mist was enshrouding the trail, and most of the deer on the western side were huddled together, shaking and staring intently at the other side of the nature reserve. I couldn't see Jojo anywhere. Strange, I thought. Alpha males patrol their herds dutifully. Why wasn't he here? I parked up at the usual spot, making sure he wasn't around. I pulled out my binoculars again and stared at the eastern area, the clouds beginning to part as the moon shone through. There was movement all along the tree line as shapes began emerging one by one. I think it took my mind a moment to process what I was seeing. I'd finally seen the deer on the eastern side. But they were wrong. Very, very wrong. Standing on their hind legs and taking confident, awkward steps, they marched out of the trees with their heads craned to the sky all of them emitting that horrible sound like their heads were being held under water as they screamed. It reverberated in my ears and made my skin break out in goosebumps. There were dozens of them, maybe a couple of hundred. Some were dragging a structure with them, others hauling a writhing shape I couldn't quite see. They congregated in a small huddle, the center of which was obscured from my vision. I look over to Jojo's herd and saw the fear in their eyes, so many of them shaking with their teeth bared a primal fear we humans have largely lost in the safety of being the dominant species. But this night showed me we were not as powerful as we think we are. As the huddle broke away and began walking towards the edge of their field, I saw what they had been huddling around. Jojo. He was still alive but barely moving and breathing. His eyes glazed over. When he began to come to, he started shrieking like a fawn. It was unnerving. They dragged him to the structure a primitive set of steps, and hollowed out a hole in its center, coated in a thick substance on the sides, just large enough for Jojo to be thrown into. I watched these things, these not-deer, use their front hooves to hoist him up into the hole, his screaming incessant the entire time. They stood around it, their necks cracked as they stared at the moon and shrieked. I looked up with them, wondering if what they sought was up there in the skies, a kind of primitive god for these creatures. I should have known better, of course. Whatever god these deers pray to, it didn't reside up above. No, no, no. It lurked deep below. A low groan called out in response. It possessed the same blood-filled lungs these monstrosities had, and Jojo's deer huddled closer together at its roar. Jojo had stopped moving, his crying completely gone as the not deer fell silent and formed a circle around their altar, snorting in unison. It grew to a fever pitch before something began dragging Jojo from beneath ripping at his limbs and pulling until a horrific squelch indicated the top had separated from the bottom. The hole spurted out blood and chunks of deer as the not-deer celebrated, danced in the rain, and feasted on the pieces. One final roar rang out from the unseen creature. It shook the ground, and I felt my balance waver for just a moment, steadying myself on the car. I know I should have booked it out of there, but I was desperate to understand what I was seeing rationalizing that perhaps this was a bizarre art piece, maybe a protest from some sort of animal rights group or even a bunch of edgy satanic teens. But the rational voice in my head grew very, very quiet when I grabbed my binoculars to look again. Every single one of them were staring up at me, emotionless, black eyes fixated on my position. I didn't wait any longer. I drove out of there at a breakneck pace, not looking at either side of the park on my exit, and near coming off the road with the lack of traction. As I got to the archway, my tire smashing against the grate, I'd inadvertently attracted the forest ranger on duty. He pulled me over and walked up to my window, a friendly smile on his face. You know there's a speed limit there for a reason, right, son? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I got a little spooked is all. I smiled back. Nerve shot to hell, he raised an eyebrow. You didn't break one of the rules now, did you? Oh no, I kept to them. It's just, well, Jojo got attacked by the eastern deer and I don't think he's doing well. It was just a shock to take in. I figured telling a half-troop would be best. Couldn't exactly say what I thought I'd really seen, could I? That so? Well, they make their choices carefully. We don't know much, but we do not want to interfere. This is how it's always been. Animals have strange practices. You get how it is. But so long as you didn't look at them and they didn't look at you... You're fine. Do you remember faces, after all? Thanks for visiting. Drive safe. He smiled again and tipped his hat before walking off to his station. 
My blood ran cold. I couldn't get those words out of my head the entire drive home. But so long as they didn't look at you, you're fine. I've not stepped outside my house since that night. I live in a remote part of the village and while I enjoy my privacy, it's been a hotbed for strange noises and unsettling emotion. Everywhere I go in my home, I feel like I'm being watched by those same vacant eyes. What happens now? What happens to those they look at? I can't get their eyes out of my head. And I can't sleep. I can't sleep at all. This isn't going to end until I figure out what they want. I wish I had more for you. I wish I could tell you more. I wish I could tell you what the not deer were, what they prayed to, why they sacrificed, what the ranger knew. But there's so many unknowns that it makes my head spin. It's just like being deep in the woods. So many twists and turns, you never know which is the right path and which is the path to death. You never know what danger lurks behind every tree. I don't know what the deer are doing. I don't know what is going on at that park. But if you value your life, you'll stay far, far away from it and whatever monster they're praying to. There's something wrong with the deer on our nature reserve. They started standing up. I am a 30-year-old man living in central Pennsylvania. If you've never been here, it's a lot of thick woods with small towns miles apart. This story takes place on my friend's land. We will call him John. He is a former army soldier whose family owns a lot of land, which we would camp on, hike on, and do whatever we wanted. I, John, and our friend Dan, who is a proud jarhead, got our girls, gear, and beer, and headed up the mountain on three ATVs for a fun night. All seemed normal when we got to our spot, a somewhat sparse, flat area where the trees weren't too thick. We set up our tents and a fire before leaving the two girls to chat while we went down to do some shooting a little way away. Now you should know when we shoot, we get really into it. None of that flat range stuff. We're like gun tubers, but only good. We have plate carriers, rifles, pistols, cases of ammo, the works. John even bought himself a pair of old crappy NODs to mess around with. The older kind that need a lot of light and only give you a blurry green shape. We loaded our guns, set up steel plates and makeshift barriers and practiced for a few hours, only stopping to eat. We eventually went back to camp and sat with the other girls to cook dinner, drink and have a laugh. We joked that the meat would attract wolves. Now, one odd thing we do, which I'm very thankful for, is we set up sand-filled cans tied to wires in a circle around our camp, an old hunting trick we learned as kids. If something were to trip this wire, the cans would clang together. This will be important later. As the moon came up and the fall chill began to set in, the lighthearted mood died. It was around midnight when we all began to feel a bit odd. We tried to chalk it up to how oddly quiet the forest was. It felt like we were being watched from all directions. One of the girls mentioned she heard something moving in the woods nearby. We sat and listened intently. We all looked toward the sound that we heard a second later, but by this point, anything even seven feet outside the camp was pitch black. Eventually, this shuffling noise became an almost running sound, if that makes any sense. Like someone circling our camp quickly, messing with us. If you've been in the woods long enough, you can tell the difference between two and four feet. Dan stands up and shouts, Dude, are you really trying to screw around? This is private property. We will kill you if we have to. Don't be stupid. We shined our flashlight into the tree line and saw nothing. The movement continued, followed by what we thought was the sound of a blade scraping along bark. We sent the girls into the tents with a pistol and grabbed our rifles. Whatever this was moved so fast we could not pinpoint it. We each had our backs to the fire and each other had our guns up, scanning the area in front of us. Dude, John, NODs, put on your NODs. John put them on and after a minute or so, he opened up fire into the tree line, followed by a piercing pained yelp or grunt. What do you see, man? Guns up, he said. What do you see? He just kept yelling to have our guns up. For the next five or so hours, we stood around the fire, 
the girls tossing us jerky energy drinks and adding wood to the flame. Anything to keep us awake. To be honest, I'm surprised my heart didn't explode. We would occasionally fire shots blindly into the wood line, hoping to at least scare it off. After a while, the can stopped rattling, but we still hear running and huffing as if this thing was stopping and watching us, then trying another spot over and over, looking for an inn. For just a few brief moments, it got close enough to the fire, and I swear I saw black fur. At first light on the verge of collapse, we all jumped on the ATVs and hauled ass back to John's house, where we passed out in his living room. The next day, Dan and I, with another friend, took two ATVs and went back for our stuff. After unsuccessfully getting any info from John about what he saw and refusing to come with us, we found the tents shredded and the coolers knocked over. The perimeter string was cut down, and there were several bullet holes. We tried to find the spot John first saw the creature. He believes he winged it. He found what appeared to be black fur stuck to a tree with blood, about six and a half feet up, and what appeared to be large claw marks on a few others. John became something of a shut-in after that. He still hangs around but isn't the same. We made two trips armed, grabbed what we could, and never went back to that area in the woods. I'm 14 years old and from Belfast, Ireland. I go out on a lot of nighttime walks with my friends, and most nights we usually go on short ones, but this night we had planned to do something else. I met my friend on her street, and then we went and picked up my other friend. For the story, I will call one Katie and the other Eli. We walked to the bus stop closest to our friend's house, and I got a bus to the university area of my city, as there are a lot of cafes and restaurants around there, and it's quite brightly lit. We got off the bus at the stop and started walking, looking for a cafe to go into. But we couldn't find one, so we decided to walk straight into the city center, which is only a short walk away. We found an open cafe and decided to go in for a snack and something to drink. It was only around 7 p.m. and it was getting quite dark already, so we decided to leave the cafe and get another bus back home. We got on the bus that would take us all home, but at the second stop, a ticket inspector got on and kicked us off when he realized we did not have any tickets and snuck on. It was now raining lightly, and we decided we would just walk to another bus stop and get on a bus we knew the inspector would not be on. We walked around five minutes to get to that bus stop, and when we got there, there wasn't another one for around 20 minutes. Damn it, let's just get to the other bus stop going through the field over there and walk through it to get home. I said to both of my friends, they agreed, so we hopped on the bus and took a seat. On the bus ride back, it started to rain heavier. When we got to the last stop, we were the last ones on the bus, and the stop happened to be in a very Protestant area, so we already felt quite unsafe being there, since most of us had quite unique Catholic names, and there had been a lot of, uh, I guess you could even say gang violence between the two religions in this time. So we were a little nervous to be in an area that technically we weren't supposed to be in. We walked through some streets and finally got to the football field that backed into the forest that we would need to cut through to get home. We sprinted across the football field trying not to get our shoes wet as it had been raining for a few days, and the field happened to be quite flooded. We got to the edge of the forest, and when the rain got a lot heavier than it was before, the forest was pitch black, so we turned on our flashlights to see where we were going. We began our walk into the forest taking careful steps as to not slip on the wet, muddy ground. Now, I spent my whole summer in that forest, and I would be confident in saying that I knew it like the back of my hand. All three of us do. When you walk in, there's a straight path that leads you through two tall fence posts after walking for about two minutes. When you get past those fence posts, you take a right and walk for another two minutes. When you arrive at the other side of the forest, where you exit into a huge field, which leads us home, Although, when we took a right at the two tall fence posts, it didn't lead us there at all. The whole forest changed shape. We had been walking down this path for around five minutes now, and the rain was so loud we could hardly hear each other. This was when we started to panic. We were running around now, trying desperately to find a way out of this place. We walked up a small hill to a big tree, a tree that we had never seen before, a tree that was definitely not there before, ever. I looked around to see my friend Katie as pale as I had ever seen her before. What do we do now? She screamed. I shout back at her that I don't know, 
Then her flashlight flickered. An iPhone flashlight. Phone flashlights never do that. Then, mine went out. I started to panic as it was now so dark that we couldn't see our hands in front of our face. Then, just after what happened, my friend Katie got a call from our friend Eli's twin sister, who didn't happen to be there that night. Katie spoke to her in a panic, but this only lasted a few seconds as her phone randomly hung up on her, and out of the blue, it just turned off. She still had more than half a battery left, which was incredibly weird. I'm a wilderness survival instructor and security contract. A couple of days ago, a student of mine and good friend who I had taken out into the woods before told me his dad just got 150 acres of land in a secluded, mountainous part of my state. It had a large amount of forest on it and hadn't been explored yet as his dad was only building something for his horses that took up about 100 yards of the property. And his horses were free to roam now. He said his dad got an insane deal on the property. My friend is now a dad of three and I know he doesn't get out into the woods that often. So I agreed to go with him because it seemed fun. And I can imagine he needs a getaway every now and then. We are both indigenous, into cars, into wilderness survival, and all sorts of stuff. So we never run out of anything to talk about in the woods. His dad, however, told us that he didn't want anybody exploring the woods unless he had a gun. He said it was because he saw coyotes. Now, we are all indigenous here, and we were raised in the same state. Coyotes don't really attack people all too often. My friend, whose name is RC, also told me a while back that when he was first at the property, he saw movement in the tree lines that was roughly human size and shape, but couldn't really tell since his eyesight was not all that good, admittedly. I brought my AR and a small flint napping kit just for the fun of it and we set off into the property. We explored a lot of the rolling fields, creeks, and multiple natural springs and ponds. Everything felt normal. It was a beautiful landscape. Eventually, we decided to get to the forested part of the property as it had yet to been explored. As soon as we entered the tree line, the entire mood shifted dramatically. The forest had an ambient of its own, very similar to the woods in the movie The Ritual. The woods were gray and dead silent, save for the occasional creaking of tall, tired cedar trees. There was a very small stream running through the center of it with sand that was black. I felt like we were surrounded, watched from all sides. It didn't take long before a very putrid stench hit our nostrils. It was the odor of rotting flesh, no doubt. We decided to follow the smell and found the remains of three to four cows. We examined the exposed skulls and couldn't find any bullet holes. It didn't appear to me that these cows had been put down by any human. Something killed them though, and there were bones spread all over for about 30 yards. There were large indentations in the dirt all around them. It was a very vague shape, so it was hard to tell what it was. We decided to press on into the woods for whatever reason. Now, we were accompanied by only silence, the putrid odor of death, and the sound of our own heartbeats. We kept stopping at the stream as I noticed different types of tracks, large coyote tracks and something else that was large but intentionally avoided the sand to see. We pressed on into the woods until we started to find trees that had been bent over and pinned behind other trees while they were still alive, something that could never, ever happen naturally. We hiked on and found what I can only describe to be a tool made of bone lying on the ground. It was extremely crude but looked like some sort of scooping tool or knife. It was disturbing because although it looked primitive, it looked way more primitive than a person would make, but an intentionally shaped tool nonetheless. We hiked on until we found a clearing with a pond that had more large oval tracks surrounding it. On the other side of the pond, we found a very strange little tree structure. It was in an A-frame. It had rocks placed up against it. However, it wasn't all that sturdy and the rocks were very peculiarly placed. We found no signs of any campfires around it. We found no fishing, no camping trash. This isn't exactly a place that you could hike to from a house. It's very remote. It was getting dark, so we decided to head back. I had a flashlight on my AR, but I did not want to rely on that in the dark with something that kills cows and makes tools out of their bones somewhere behind us. We made our way out of the forest and back to where the trucks were parked just in time before it got too dark to see. As we were leaving, we saw something on top of one of the hills that we couldn't quite identify, but didn't stick around to find out what it was. 
It's worth mentioning the previous owner began construction on something on the property, abruptly halted construction and left. Again, I have no idea what this thing was, so feel free to let me know in the comments down below. My family lived in a nice house in the middle of some dense woods. A few of my friends consistently brought their four-wheelers with them when they came to spend the night. We had a huge yellow four-wheeler and rode pretty much constantly that year. The woods behind my parents' house had trails every which way that snaked around the hollers in the roads. My friends and I had these big plans to get street signs and put them on the trees so that all of our trails would have their names proudly displayed. One day, a friend came to stay, and we rode around the trails for hours. When we became bored of the trails, we took off the main road to a fire training center about three miles away. The fire training center was down a one-lane gravel road with these trees butting up to the side so close that a car would get scratched going down it. At the end of the road was a pole gate to keep people like us out. On the way there, we passed a small pickup truck with two men in it. When we got to the little trail that went down and around the gate, we saw a dead dog wrapped up in a blanket blocking off the path. We decided to turn around because I didn't want to run over the dog. So we started heading up back on the main road, and again about halfway back, past the small pickup truck with men in it. My friend and I joked that the men are following us because they know we saw the dog they dropped off and didn't bury. We get almost back to the house and decide that we can probably find another trail around the dog, maybe one on the other side of the gate, so off we go. We turn onto the little gravel road and go to the end. There is no other trail, no other way around. But the dog is kind of laying on the half blanket. So, we sit there for a few minutes while I try to convince my friend if she just tugs on the edge of the blanket we can move the blanket and dog out of the way without touching it. She's not budging, but I really want to ride on the other side of the gate. After a few minutes it is clear she's not touching the blanket, so we turn around and head back home. We start back down the gravel road and after a second or two, we turn to the straight part of it. Panic set in quickly. The small pickup truck is on the road blocking our only way out. The trees touch both the sides of the truck, so there is no way around it. Two large men are sitting there staring at us. After what feels like forever, I whip the four-wheeler around and go through the trail anyway. We get around the gate and, then, eventually, we are to safety. Were they watching me try to persuade her to move the blanket? Could they see us the whole time? Were they still moving until we got to the clear part? What would have happened if I didn't give up on the blanket? Those questions scare me now as much as they did back then. The gravel road only goes to the fire training center, which is blocked off by a large metal gate. A car that pulls down there is only able to get back the entire way out onto the main road. Anyway, we soon forgot about it, and it really didn't make much sense, and nothing really changed. I do like to think that our town is safe, and that the woods in general are safe. But... I don't know what those men's intentions were. My grandparents used to own 10 acres of land in the panhandle of Idaho. Most of the property was wooded, however some of the trees on the property were cut down and turned into four-wheeler trails. When we would visit, my sister and I would spend at least one of the days up there riding our four-wheelers. During one of these trips, I had an encounter with something strange, to say the least. The day started out rather normal, with my family waking up and having breakfast. As usual, my sister and I asked our grandparents if we could go ride the four-wheelers. After getting permission to do so, we went outside to the shed behind their house and started up the four-wheelers. After a few hours of riding on the trails, I saw my sister park next to the shed. When I drove up next to her, she told me she was going to get a drink and asked me if I wanted one. I told her no thank you and continued driving. After a few turns, I heard a loud growl over the engine of the four-wheeler. I came to a complete stop thinking something was wrong with the engine, but then I heard the growl again. Only this time, it was louder and more guttural. At this point, I noticed the forest was completely silent. 
There weren't the usual bird sounds or any insects. I began frantically searching for what made the growl when I saw it. In a large bush just off the trail, I saw two large yellow eyes staring back at me. The eyes were probably eight or nine feet from the ground and protruding from the top of the bush were antlers. Once I saw this thing, I felt a feeling of dread wash over me. I could feel that if this creature wanted to kill me, it could at any second. My fight or flight kicked in at this point and subconsciously my brain decided I was going to run. I turned my four-wheeler back on in record timing and sped out of those woods. A few months later, in the fall of that year, we were visiting my grandparents again. Seven turkeys had moved on to their property, and about halfway through our trip we noticed that one had gone missing. We thought nothing of it really, but when I drove past that spot, I heard the growl earlier that year. I noticed a smell of rot and decay. I ventured slightly into the woods and saw a mutilated turkey. I realized what must have killed this turkey and quickly went back to the four-wheeler and back inside. On the same trip, we were leaving the grandparents' house to go to a nearby city. When we were pulling out of their driveway, a large dark figure ran across the road leaving their property. My grandparents insisted that it was a coyote, but coyotes don't run on two legs like that. Anyways, a few years later my grandparents moved out of that house. They said it was to be closer to us, but but I think it might have been because of that creature. I don't know what I saw, but I believe it might have been a wendigo. It scared me to death, and I believe it scared them out of that house. It was mid-late August 2016 and we had just closed on the purchase of one and a half story log cabin bordering the Washita National Forest. This was a property with about 15 wooded acres, two ponds, and a wet weather creek. I had fallen in love with the area on the drive to see the property. Driving along the winding mountain highways I couldn't imagine anything more beautiful to look at than the tree covered mountaintops. What I saw as a rolling sea of trees was a welcome distraction from the shoulderless edges that dropped off into the dark, creepy rocky woods below. The air felt different. It was lighter and easier to breathe. I was ready to begin unloading things as soon as we signed the papers to the close, and we were handed the keys. After unloading some of my things, my eight-year-old son and I were back on the road to load up more things and then drive back up. As a boy, he had family reunions nearby at Robber's Cave. Once we arrived, it was already late in the evening. Due to our very long drive, we were all ready to call it a night. My father passed out in an oversized quilted hammock in the living room, and my son and I had a queen-sized air mattress in the master bedroom upstairs. We had not been in the bed very long before I heard what I presumed to be some unusual birds making a hooting-type sound. There were three distinct vocalizations, and oddly enough, only one of them sounded masculine. I considered the sound and wondered what kind of bird it could be, and why it was so loud at this late hour. Soon I heard little things hitting the glass. It sounded like it could have been a swarm of bugs flying into the reflection on the uncovered window and sliding glass door to the back deck. It continued, and it seemed excessive. I looked and saw little twigs and pebbles hitting the back, after bouncing off the glass. I heard something rather large come off the tree line before the cabin. I heard branches breaking and leaves rustling. It sounded like something was making a beeline for the house. I kept hearing thuds and I believed large rocks were being tossed or pounded on the ground. It was so unexpected, but I thought there were many animals accustomed to the property being vacant. It could be a black bear. However, I then heard the knocking sounds. It was unmistakably the sound of a piece of wood being used to knock on a tree. At this point, all I could think was Bigfoot. There was a heavy downpour that came down at 11.30pm. There could have been lightning and thunder, but I really didn't notice. This was such a heavy rain, and I couldn't be certain if these things were still out there. The noise seemed to have stopped. I didn't even attempt to sleep because I was thinking so many thoughts about what had just taken place and I never actually believed the Bigfoot stories on TV. Did Bigfoot knock on the trees? That always seemed so far-fetched to me. Did Bigfoot make weird hoot and holler sounds? 
What on earth was making those noises anyway? Finally, the rain had stopped and it still seemed rather peaceful. Of course, it wasn't long before the branches breaking and trees splitting sound began. I heard what I believed were rocks. This is a mountain. The very loud and aggressive knock 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 sound on the tree in front of my cabin below was what really set me in motion. These were followed by big, exploding sounds. It sounded like something was now whacking something against the cabin wall below. It shook the cabin and I believed it to be very threatening. Naturally, I woke my son up and took him to a room where I felt he would be safer. I didn't trust the sighting glass door and I didn't know why I think the flimsy office door was safer. Just being out of sight just made us feel better, I guess. I turned on the deck light in the front and back porch lights. I opened the upstairs office window and yelled out, Leave us alone! We're trying to sleep! I checked all the windows and opened slightly to listen, and all was quiet, except my son who was complaining that I woke him up at 4am. My dad woke up to me checking all the windows and talking to my son. My dad was upset that I didn't wake him. At daylight, he insisted we go out and walk around the cabin looking for evidence of this wild report. I didn't see all the broken branches or big rocks, though I did notice later three trees in the front yard were definitely split in two, and it wasn't by anything natural. The tree trunk was easily eight centimeters around. My father is one of the ones who found the footprints, which I have never ever seen in my life. They were pressed into the mud through the fallen yellow and brown leaves, they were three very large human-like footprints. There were no claws or nail impressions. There was also an ape, like juvenile-sized handprint. These prints were going up to the stone walkway leading up to my covered wraparound porch. My dad insisted that it must be a black bear, but I'm not sure. As I share this, I'm still wondering what made those noises that night. Sometimes I think it's a Bigfoot. It sounds a lot like proper Bigfoot etiquette. But at the same time, I have no idea what this mysterious beast was, or what it possibly could have wanted. It was back in the 1980s. At the time, I was in my late 20s and I would often grab my collie, Lacey, and drive my Mustang convertible to the park not too far from our home to go hiking. Although I was a single female, I always felt safe hiking in that park. It was like my second backyard. It was a hot Sunday morning in July. There was a slight breeze and a beautiful blue sky. It was pretty early, around 8.30am, and the park was deserted when we pulled up into the parking area. The parking lot was near the picnic area and restrooms, and it would get crowded later in the day when the families arrived for their picnics and the fishermen would make their way out to the lake and try their luck at catching that elusive big one. This park covers 1,900 acres of land and has miles of wooded dirt trails that intersect each other. There are a few main trails that pass by a lake and meander along a lazy river and lead to three hidden breathtaking waterfalls. It is heavily forested, and in the summer, when the leaves are all on board, the trail's visibility is limited to the path. I loved that park, hiked it often, and knew the trails like the back of my hand, and enjoyed having it to myself. I intentionally chose times when I knew it would be less crowded. The lot I parked in is across a little road from the head of my trail. It's my favorite trail. As I called Lacey out of the car and snapped on her leash, Another car pulled into the lot. He parked rather close to me, and I found it rather annoying and a bit strange. I go there for solitude and peace, and there were plenty of other parking spots, and there was no need to crowd me. The trail Lacey and I wanted to hike on was across the road, so I headed that way. We started up the hill and onto a heavily wooded hiking trail. For some reason, I was feeling a sense of dread and glanced at the man as he was getting out of his car. I am somewhat suspicious when hiking alone and immediately found him a bit off. Something about him was setting off alarm bells in my head. He appeared to be in his 40s and was by himself, which is not unusual. A lot of people hiked by themselves. It was his attire and demeanor that caught me off guard. 
He was dressed like no other hiker I have ever seen. He had on dress pants and shiny black dress shoes, like the ones my dad would always wear going to church. The clothes and shoes were a bit shabby, but still not something somebody would wear when hiking. None of the trails in this park were paved. They were all dirt and often muddy since they crossed meandering streams. But it was his expression that struck me the most. He was staring intently at Lacey and I, with no expression on his face, and it was making me extremely uncomfortable. I thought to myself, who does that, and who wears dress shoes hiking? I began to think, and I became more uneasy. There was just something creepy about him. Most people who hike the trails keep to themselves, but will say a brief hi, how you doing, or wave, something like that. This man simply stared intently at Lacey and I with no expression in his blank eyes. I knew somewhere deep down inside of me that it would be the best plan of action to avoid him entirely. It was a little voice in my head that I had to listen to. I considered giving up my hiking altogether that day, but I'd been looking forward to it and Lacey was raring to go, and maybe I was just being paranoid. So I turned back around and began walking up the main hiking trail. I decided to verge off one of the many little paths that branched off the main trail. I chose this trail as it was not marked with any signage and did not go towards the falls of the river, but winded through the dense, heavily forested woods. It was not as popular as the other trails, and I figured I could avoid the man as he probably would choose one of the more popular marked trails that most hikers would. As Lacey and I walked along, I glanced around to see if I could still see him. To my dread, I realized that he had also chosen the trail we were hiking. I looked around to see if there were any other hikers out, but it was just him, myself, and Lacey. I was not concerned to the point of panic, but still somewhat freaked out. It was just himself, myself, and Lacey. I was not concerned to the point of panic, but still freaked out. I decided it was best to continue to steer clear of him, and as soon as I was able, I took a different cross trail to avoid him. The trail I chose headed off in an entirely different direction from the way he was headed. I kept walking at a fast pace, trying to put as much distance between me and him as possible. I tried to enjoy the gorgeous, beautiful day, but I could not shake the feelings of unease and all the while walking tried to stay diligent of the man's location. After hiking for about five minutes, I began to feel my sense of unease increasing. I turned back to notice that the same figure, once again, was following us in the distance, gaining on us slowly but steadily. He had taken the same intersecting trail as Lacey and I and was following behind us again. He did not appear to be enjoying the walk, he was not looking at the nature around him, just staring right at Lacey and me. He continued to stalk us at a quick pace with a sense of purpose into his stride. His face was motionless, his eyes never leaving us. As I glanced to him, it seemed waves of malice were emanating from him, and I was more scared than I had ever been in my life. By this time, Lacey was beginning to feel my anxiety. She was a beautiful dog and looked a lot like Lassie. She was a good 65 pounds and unlike most collies, did not care for strangers or anything else out of the ordinary. She was also beginning to pick up on my emotions and starting to perceive this danger. She began stopping and turning, looking back at him perceiving this person as a threat. I knew all of these trails like the back of my hand and was quite sure we could lose him. I crossed into another trail, and I thought surely we had gotten far enough ahead of him that he would be unable to determine which trail we had walked. Glancing nervously behind me, but much to my horror, when I looked up the trail ahead, I saw him walking straight towards us at a determined pace. He had somehow found the trail that circles around us and then crossed over to head us off. This could be no accident. It was obvious to me now that he was intentionally following us. But why? My brain went into overdrive. All of my senses were telling me that I was not in a good situation. I wondered what I could do. I had a very, very bad feeling about this man and had to find an escape route and get back to the safety of my car as quickly as I could. I hastily looked around for another trail that I could take before he would reach us. There was nothing quickly thought it through, and determined that my only options were to turn and run back to the opposite direction, dash into the heavily forested woods, 
or walk right past him. I looked at him, judged the distance, and knew if I ran, even with his street clothes on, he could possibly catch me on the trail. I had no desire to run off into the woods as the grounds are heavily covered with tripping hazards, and I've watched enough horror movies to know that the running victim always trips and falls out of panic. I contemplated all of those options, and you are probably going to think I'm crazy, but I decided the best course of action was to keep walking straight ahead and walk past him. I was not alone. I had Lacey, and she gave me the courage to confront the alarming, disconcerting stranger. As we walked closer to him, he said nothing but kept staring at us intently with his blank, emotionless expression. His eyes were very dark and menacing. I walked nervously towards him, and as we got closer and closer to him, I began talking to Lacey under my breath, urging her on with a desperate voice pleading over and over, Get him! Get him! Lacey felt my fear. She felt it to her very core and fed off of it. She began growling low in her throat. The closer he got to us, the louder and more profound the rumbling from within her became. By the time we passed him, I was physically holding her off by her leash. She was lunging at him, snarling and baring her teeth. He did not react like someone being threatened aggressively by a dog. There was no resentment, no irritation. Strangely, he said nothing to me, and I said nothing to him. He passed by us and gave Lacey a wide berth, no longer looking at us or showing any interest at all. I lightly said, that's not nice, Lacey. I was petting her and encouraging her to growl at him the entire time, though. She continued to give him the Clint Eastwood stare and kept barking until he was well past us. I kept an eye on him, ensuring he did not back away or turn back towards us. I was eventually relieved to see that he made his way to a trail that led to the parking lot. I got in his car and drove away. I continued my hike heading to a different side of the park. I kept thinking about the man and wondering what he had been doing. To this day, I think Lacey saved me from an awful situation, and when we returned home that day, I made sure she got an extra special treat. Hello Swamp Dweller, I have been listening to your show for quite a while now. I want to tell you how I have seen a skimwalker and got away. First, let me give you some background. To protect my identity, I would not disclose my proper name, so call me S. I am a 25-year-old male in Berks County, Pennsylvania. The events transpired at the Monocacy Creek Trail inside Douglasville, Pennsylvania. One day, I decided I was going to go hiking and probably camp out for a while when darkness flooded the woods. I never really had many experiences that made it not okay to be here. I walked this trail from noon to almost dusk because I love nature. So, as everything was, it was peaceful, calm, serene, up until about the evening, sometime around 6.30pm. Although, as expected, my feelings of dread and being watched were strong. There was also the stink of hot garbage, and a skunk had a baby. I immediately noticed that I heard nothing. I am a firm believer in going with your gut. Of course, now, there are possibility of bears or predators in the area scrounging around for food, but I stayed as alert as best as I could. As expected, I was plunged in utter darkness. There wasn't a moon out now. It was a new moon. I had a flashlight, but there was this feeling that if I turned it on, I would see this thing just standing there. I felt like this thing was evil, nothing but hatred standing before me nearby. I knew this trail inside and out in my mind. I lit a blaze of courage. I have till this day. I have no idea where it came from. I took off my socks and my shoes. I ducked down and slowly moved at a snail's pace. I didn't make much sound as I felt the ground below me. It took everything in me to try my best not to fumble around and to get away from whatever this thing was. Slowly but surely, the feeling of being watched went away. So I turned on my flashlight to locate where I was, just for a second. I am almost at the trail. I am doing my best to make it there. I turned off my flashlight, and at a breakneck speed, running like a flash, I jetted out of this place. But, out of nowhere, I heard something that shocked me and made me trip out of focus, lost, and how close this thing was without me knowing it. What scared me the most, and made me trip, was I heard a voice say, and this demonic, 
a human-like tone. But I knew it wasn't a human. But for whatever reason, I flipped on my flashlight and saw what looked like this nine-foot-tall creature. It had its flesh nearly rotting off. The smell of it was unbearably intense. The teeth were almost red, smiling at me as if it were trying to be friendly. But I saw them, these sharp, jagged, menacing teeth. I don't know where this thing came from. Still, this incredible strength from within me told me to pick up a stick that was on the ground and try to swing it at this thing. I didn't know what to do at this point, so I picked it up, stood up, and speared the thing with it. Within seconds, I picked out my lighter, I forgot that I had it in my pocket, and put it close to this thing on the stick trying to burn it. Standing there, lighting this thing on fire, it screamed a sound so horrific, I thought I would faint just from being there, smelling this dead burning flesh and this horrible scream that this thing was creating. As I knew now, out of fear, this was a skimwalker. I kicked the stick into it, trying to make sure it would stay. The fire wasn't too strong, so I know it probably wasn't going to kill it, but it would definitely keep it at bay, at least long enough for me to get away. I ran to the field that I saw, and I knew it was a place where a couple of people I knew would drive their ATVs and dirt bikes, so I knew it would be a quick way to get out of here. I ran so fast, not looking back, I soon saw the highway and ran to it, and that's when, from a distance, I knew that I was safe. I turned around and I saw these yellow eyes standing in the dark field staring at me. That's when the thing turned around and fled back into the woods before altogether seeing it disappear. It took one more look behind itself at me, then screamed and ran back. To this day, I haven't had any recent encounters since this all happened in the late summer of August of 2018. Anyways, this was my story on the nature trails that I'll never walk again. This is how I met a skimwalker and got away. For anyone out there, be careful what you wish for. Sometimes you might want to see something creepy, but you definitely don't. Stay safe out there, swamp folk, and thank you if you decide to share my story. Hey, swamp folk. Today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. The new year is a great time to focus on what's most important to you. Whether it's saving money by ordering less takeout, learning to cook, or prioritizing your wellness, HelloFresh is here to help with endless options to make cooking at home simple and enjoyable. HelloFresh cuts back on time spent in the kitchen so you can spend it on your resolutions with meals ready in around 30 minutes or less. Plus, quick and easy meals, including 20-minute recipes and low prep and easy cleanup options. These all provide you an even faster route to putting food on the table. HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal of the same quality, and you can save on average over $65 per month when you order HelloFresh instead of grocery shopping. There's more money to put toward those other 2022 goals of yours. HelloFresh offers the flexibility you need to easily customize your order online or in the app. Easily change your delivery day, food preferences, and plan size, or skip a week whenever you need to. So, what are you waiting for? Join me and tons of others in the swamp today. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Swamped16 and use code Swamped16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 free gifts. I've been using HelloFresh for 2 years now. I really enjoy the service. It really helps me keep up with my meal plans and my workout grind. I think this is something everybody would love. So again, join me and many others in the swamp today with America's number one meal kit. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Swamped16 and use code Swamped16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 free gifts. Hey Swamp Dweller, this would be the first story I have ever submitted to any YouTuber, or anyone for that matter. I experience these encounters with a couple of my friends. I usually only go deep into the wilderness or explore with one or two people, or sometimes just myself. Going off the fact that I've lived in remote places my entire life, I have always felt comfortable. I hope to tell more stories and share my encounters with you, but this is probably one of the most recent and scariest I have ever had. 
I have a ritual that my best friend of six years and I attend every year. His family and I go up to the Northern California mountains this year, Mount Shasta. I don't go with my siblings or anyone out of my own family. They are not the type of people who go out and do stuff like this. My friends and me enjoy this kind of stuff, but this time was like no other. I woke up the day before, remembering the trip of the next day, and I had almost had a heart attack. I was nowhere near prepared and had no time to get ready because it had slipped my mind, so I did what I could. I finally got most of my stuff ready and headed out to my friend's house. We will call him KJ. KJ and I lived right next to each other's houses, almost a neighborhood apart. There was a small set of woods that separated us. We had our paths that we knew like the back of our hands. I made it over to the little nature trail that I always walked to get to his house. I had walked down it and made it over to his house, packed all my stuff into his family's car, and was excited that we were finally going to go again. I love spending time with KJ and his family. I consider them my second family and love them all dearly. We arrived at the campground. It wasn't in the middle of the forest this time, but it was at a recreational and somewhat popular area of a small town. We unpacked and went to explore this tiny but fantastic place, and we ended up finding this excellent swimming hole that was a stream of melted snow water from the mountains. It was freezing cold. It was perfect for swimming after long hikes and relaxing, though. It had a rope swing, and I got some pretty cool videos and pictures from it. I met some new people, and all in all, it was fun. And I could say this whole trip was fantastic, even the encounter I had with the thing in the woods. Well, we ended up driving almost an hour out to Lake Siskiyou and finding an overgrown trail that hadn't seen a lot of people. It was more of a game trail, if anything. We all were experienced with the forest and nature and didn't mind going out to unexplored places. So we walked down this rocky, sandy path that followed the edge of a stream and was relatively peaceful until we saw it. I'm calling it a thing since I have no idea what it could be. At first, we had started to smell something. It smelled like rotten garbage or roadkill. It was disgusting and made KJ's mom almost puke. It didn't bother me, but it was still a powerful and grotesque smell. But after smelling this for about 30 seconds, we had this awful feeling. I knew what it was, and it was almost like a primal instinct. No one else knew, but I've had my fair share of wildlife encounters. That being bears, bobcats, etc. At first, we may have run into a bobcat or a mountain lion den, which would make sense. So, I hinted that we should go back not directly telling them that we needed to leave as to not freak them out. I think at the time, they just figured it was too much of a weird experience, so they picked up the hens, and we headed back. Then, however, we started to hear whoops or whooping noises, which sent shivers down my spine. I immediately thought of a Sasquatch hearing the stories and folk tales. I've always been into the supernatural, and know a thing or two about such a topic. However, it chilled me to the bone, and I picked up the pace, no longer thinking of KJ or his family. I'm sure they probably wondered why I was walking so fast and looking over my shoulder. And I figure I was looking over my shoulder because I was paranoid. Then, rocks and pine cones were thrown at us, and all kinds of other small things from the forest floor. So we took it as a warning and got out of there. I remember looking back behind me at some point, and seeing a figure about seven feet tall in the trees. It was reddish in color. It somewhat blended in with the manzanita and pine trees, and I froze. KJ then asked what it was, and his family kept walking, and I showed him. He said he couldn't see it, but he believed what I saw, and believed what I saw was probably Sasquatch. Thank you for letting me share this, and if you want, I can always share more stories in the future. My name is Johnny. This story happened on June 29th, 2018 in the northern region of Florida. I was 21 years old, working as a beach photographer that summer with my buddy, who had just graduated from college. We both attended the same college in Pennsylvania. Our company put us in a four-bedroom townhouse with about ten other people. It was a Friday, and I had the day off. Everyone else was working that day, so I just sat in the house relaxing. As the day went on, I became more and more anxious because I had not done anything active. Usually, 
I walked at least 10 miles a day on the beach, taking photos of vacationers, and another day on the beach didn't sound as appealing as taking a break inside with the AC and some quality Netflix. But today, I felt I had been too lazy with my time, so I decided to go for a night walk throughout the neighborhood behind our housing development on this nice little nature trail. It's enjoyable to walk there at night, because it's always tranquil, and there is a lot of lovely foliage, mansions, etc. on this walk. I discovered a bike trail that I did not know existed before, and decided to check it out. It goes into the woods, and I thought, why not? Maybe being in the trees will remind me of home in rural Pennsylvania, and relaxed my mind. Little did I know, uh, it would be the exact opposite. The bike trail runs perpendicular to the road and goes along a narrow field of power lines that cut through the woods. It goes for what I would guess about 15 miles at least. I was walking for 20 minutes, and all I could hear was the sound of nature around me. It was very calming, even though the woods always did give me that spooky feeling. It was a nice place to walk, or so I thought. Along my left was the tree line, to my right was the field with a line of telephone poles cutting through the middle of it, and much less thick tree line on the other side, with some swampy marsh areas. It was a full moon that night, so I wasn't in complete darkness and could see pretty much all around me. So, about 10 to 15 minutes into my walk, some clouds came in and covered the moon. It got much darker out of nowhere, so I turned on the flashlight on my phone. I heard a strange noise coming from my right across the field. It sounded like a boar or a pig. It let out a long, low grunt. It didn't sound like the normal sounds that I was used to. It sounded like something had caused it distress. I stood there listening for another sound, but there were no more. I kept walking, hoping I wouldn't hear it again, as it did come out of nowhere, and it startled me. Instantly, I got the feeling of something not being right. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I was very unnerved, like I felt like I was being watched. I tried to find where I was on Google Maps, but they would not load because the service was very weak. I eventually ran into another path that veered off into the woods and there luckily was a map on a board beside it. I stared down the course for a few seconds, contemplating whether to take it. It looked like that cliché shortcut that looks super scary but gets you to your destination a bit quicker. This one was dark, and I mean dark. There was a thick canopy above, as this part of the woods, there was only about a foot between the dense trees and the path on both sides. Without the light on my phone, I would not have been able to see a thing in there, I decided to turn and walk along this path, as it was a quicker way home instead of going back and around the way I originally had came. Then, as I was about to head down the said path, I heard footsteps. I stopped and turned my flashlight off to listen. I wanted to make sure I wasn't being paranoid and scaring myself, but I could indeed still hear them. They were coming towards me from the direction I was headed on the main path. I ran over into the trees and hid because I wasn't about to run into some potentially crazy people out here in the woods. As I was hiding in the trees and waiting for them to pass me, I instantly smelled something terrible. I thought maybe I was just so scared that I soiled my pants, but that was not the case. Instead, it smelled like something decomposing, like the smell of a dead deer carcass baking out in the sun. If you've ever been hunting, you definitely know that smell. The footsteps became increasingly closer, then they passed me. I counted three people, or should I say silhouettes, and I couldn't make out their faces or even their clothes. They walked in a straight line, their heads staring straight ahead of them, and none of them said a single word. The one in the middle was dragging some sort of bag behind them along the concrete. I waited for about five minutes until I could no longer see them, hear them, or smell that smell anymore. I started walking down the dark path, slowly but surely. I tried walking quickly, but I wanted to stay quiet, as I was pretty freaked out. I was wearing flip-flops and they clicked my heels with every step, so the slower I was, the quieter I was. I walked for about 10 minutes, and I started to hear footsteps. Again. I stopped and turned off my flashlight. The footsteps were coming from behind me this time. I ran back into the trees and waited to see if those people were going to come back again. And inevitably, it was. They brought that awful smell back with them and walked past me the same way, dragging the bag behind them. Were these people following me? Why did they happen to turn around and come onto this path as well? I stayed out there in the bushes for about 20 minutes or so, unsure of what to do. 
I didn't know if I should keep going the way I was going or run back. I hoped they didn't hear me, though. As I waited, they came by again. Which is the freaky part. I heard a man's voice say a girl's name this time, though. Barbara Ann Wilcox. Or something like that. I waited another five minutes and just started running down the path. I picked up my flip-flops to make sure I didn't make any noise and didn't even turn my flashlight back on. I ran for what honestly seemed like ten minutes until I eventually had to stop to take a breath. I was still in the complete darkness and I turned my flashlight back on to ensure I wasn't being followed. I didn't smell that horrible smell, so I turned the flashlight back off to save my phone's battery and not give myself away. I didn't know how much longer I had to keep going as this path did not look nearly as long on the map. I began to hear sticks breaking in the woods. They didn't sound like footsteps, but somewhat random. One would break to the left, then to the right a few minutes later. Finally, they started to get louder, and eventually I bolted again. I ran, and I ran, and I ran. I was afraid that there would be something chasing me if I ever turned around. The sticks breaking seemed to follow along on both sides, not too far behind me. It was a fight or flight situation, and I fled as fast as I could. After what seemed like running for an hour, I eventually saw lights and came out of the woods next to a sewage plant. I hurried home along the highway. No one was home when I returned to the townhouse, as they had all gone to a beach party. So I sat down, got a glass of water, and searched the name I heard on Google. Barbara Ann Wilcox. This is where it gets strange. In a nutshell... Barbara Ann Wilcox and a friend were from Iowa, and they were hiking through Florida in the 1970s. On their trip, they were murdered by a man named Gerard Schaefer. The cherry on top of the cake is that it happened in 1973, and the skeletal remains of the girls were found scattered throughout the area, which is known as Oak Hammock Park, in 1977 by a group of fishermen. Why were three people, if that's what they were, Walking through the woods at night in the pitch black, saying the name of a girl that died 40 years ago, about seven hours away, in a different part of Florida altogether. And what the hell were they dragging behind them? I'm not sure if I want to know the answers. Throughout the rest of my summer, working in Florida, I continued to do my night walks, but I never went on that bike trail again. So, if you're ever alone in the woods, please be careful. You never know who or what you will find, or worse who might see you.